Welcome to the Film Board, the movie conversation podcast reviewing the latest releases that you've seen and really want to talk about. My name is Ocean, and I am the host of the Film Board podcast. On this episode, we're talking about the Batman. Fear is a tool. But when that light hits the sky, it's not just a call. So morning. I've been trying to reach you. Find the gun! This is about a king. And Rither's the match. I can take care of myself. If this continues, it won't be long before you've nothing left. I don't care what happens to me. It's only gonna get worse for you. I'm vengeance. Today, I am chatting with Pete Wright, host of the Next Real podcast series and the man, the myth, the legend, host of What's That Smell? Tommy Metz the Third, to get their thoughts on this movie so we can share them with all of you. Welcome, Tommy. Thank you so much, Ocean. And I would like to point out that I am a co host of What's That Smell with the aforementioned Pete Wright. Ugh, he's all uh, over the place. Cares, nobody cares about that, Tommy. You, got it. So, okay. <laughs> your world, just living in it. Got it. Exactly. Well, well, welcome, welcome, Pete. Pete's present. Uh, normally, I ask, tell me what you knew about this movie and what your expectations you had going in. Well, since we're talking about the Batman, we can just skip what you knew because you knew it was Batman. Tommy, I'll start with you. What were your expectations of this movie going in? I am on record of not being an enormous superhero fan, but if I picked one, it would 100% be Batman, probably because he's not a superhero. He just has gadgets and he's rich and he's the world's greatest detective. So I've always loved all of the Batman movies, all of them. No, that's not true. I like the ones that are good. <laughs> can get away with bat nipples on suits and stuff. No, I'm not for that. But um, so I'm a really big Batman fan. And when I saw the trailer, it looked really gritty and it looked more closer to like what the Dark Knight was than any of the Tim Burtons that we were really sort of going into a nightmare city. And I was really, really excited about it. Pete, what were your expectations going in? I was just hoping it would live up to your expectations because I know you're a, a kind of a Batman guy. And I thought if if you come into this conversation happy, then I'll be happy. Um, I my expectations. I I I like Matt Reeves. I I liked what I saw of the trailer. I thought this was going to be something potentially different, and it's. I think it's it's getting harder to to make movies that feel like grown up movies um, that don't end in big superhero like muscle offs and superpower offs. And I was so hopeful that this movie would give us something that felt earthen. And, um, and, and so that's, that's what I went in looking for something that, that felt lived in and felt, you know, it, it felt like as dark as the, as the dark night should be for me. And it turns out, uh, I kind of feel like Matt Reeves made Christopher Nolan look like Tim Burton. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a silly joke. Okay. <laughs> well, hey, we'll, we'll, hey, let's let's save a little for the show here, Pete. You're jumping ahead. All right, so I'm done. I'm actually done with the show. That was, that was oh, the thank you so much for stopping by. So, exactly. yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> Good show. All right, so my expectations, as uh, Pete uh, rightfully said, were sky high. I love Batman. I've always loved Batman, and I think that Batman is the secret ingredient to improve every movie ever made ever in that anytime I watch a bad movie, the first thing I say to it is the what would have made this movie better? Batman. So my expectations were <laughs> that sky high. I uh, admittedly early on had a little bit of trepidation hearing about um, Robert Pattinson's going to be Batman this time. And then I said, you know what? Michael Keaton did it, so let's not let's not judge, right? So let's see what they put what they put out. I saw one trailer, and I was immediately blown away by it, and said, "Okay, I'm in. I don't need to see anything else about it. I'm going to wait till the movie comes out." Um, so those were my expectations going in. I expected to see a movie that I really liked or loved. Mm. Oh, hi! 
really high. Oh, my expectations were sky high. It's yeah, just like yeah. no room. No, yeah. no, no. There was no, there was no room. There was no. If 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 it were if they had, if they had given us another Batman and Robin, I'd have uh, thrown a, thrown the table off. And you know, there's, there'd have been a whole. Well, you know how you like, is that, flip a, the is table. that a phrase? Like I will not be treated. Yeah, yeah, flip, flip the table. Flip the table. Yeah. <laughs> flip the table. Yes. Yeah. Like, throw, so, throw the yeah. table <laughs> off of <laughs> the floor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would have thrown the table off of the yeah you know the balcony or the chair. I don't know. Just got it. I'd have flipped yeah. the table and said I will not be treated this way in this establishment. But, <laughs> but it, they did not deliver Batman and Robin, so that is great. Mm-hmm. Well, let me just uh, start with the kind of a quick the setup of the story. Uh, not not really the whole overview because this was, uh, if you haven't checked the running time yet, people, it's a three hour movie. So there's a lot to there's a lot of movie, a lot to unpack, and a lot that is great about it. But there's this starting off with kind of the basic rundown that is slightly spoiler free for a minute if you're still just dipping your toe and finding out about about the Batman. Um, so the movie is uh, Gotham City, present day. Uh, the Batman has been working uh, Gotham streets for two years and has created a healthy fear of him among lower level criminals. Uh, th- and uh, the mayor of Gotham City has just been killed in his home on Halloween night. And uh, high ranking uh, cop Jim Gordon, not yet commissioner, has brought the Batman to the actual crime scene. Um, and, there, and there, the Batman investigates uh, what he sees, but is also given a note that was left with the victim from the killer addressed to the Batman. And now the Batman must now use his wits and fists to determine who killed the mayor and why that killer wants him involved. If you wanted to know anything about it without being spoiled, that's the end of that. Batman's Bruce Wayne. Okay, sorry. I just had to. <laughs> <laughs> I've been just sitting on that for so long. <laughs> <laughs> okay well uh yes that was uh that was definitely the spoiler there that mm-hmm. batman is bruce wayne so um i think that the maybe the first place to start is the beginning since this is a new version of the batman and uh they're they have to do a little bit of time in this to set up the characters and set up the world we're living in. Cause we know what the Batman is as far as his powers and abilities, but we don't know what is this one that we have here and what's, what's going on with them. And so um, the, the way they set up the Batman, so let's just start with the Batman himself. Uh, the way they set up in this one is that the in- initial time you see the Batman is a gang of I guess we'll call them thugs are, are, you know, running around, you know, punching people, knocking them out randomly. And they go onto a train. They start to harass another guy that they're wanting to punch and beat up and actually want one of their new initiates to come knock him out. And then the Batman shows up. And so as an introduction to the character, you know, the scene works where the Batman shows up, of course, st- stops them, fights them, shows you a little bit not only of his fighting style, but also some of the powers and abilities of his suit, which in this case include, the most bulletproof suit I've ever seen <laughs> ever, 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 ever. Yeah. you know? And so, yeah. so that they, they, they set, so they, when they set him up that way and they, you know, give you, this is your entrance and stuff into this is the type of Batman we're going to get. Um, what did you guys think of the, and I'll start with you, Pete. What did you think of this introduction of the Batman and what this version was going to now bring? Well, okay. So speaking specifically of the introduction of the Batman, I think this was the, the given the hindsight of having spent the next three hours with the Batman. I think this is a really interesting way to do it. Note, he walks into the train platform. (laughs) He walks onto the platform. I think this is the first time we have this experience, this entrance to the Batman where he doesn't like come in from some swoop swoop down like thing, right? He doesn't fall through a thing with the cape out like he he walks in he emerges from the darkness and i think that ends up being uh, a a real testament to his journey the way they present him on screen and his journey from vengeance to uh what is ultimately i think a, a an ending that is weirdly hopeful mm-hmm. for his character like that that makes his his transition um, you know, I think really interesting. So this first scene where he has to walk onto the train platform with like rejects from the purge or, uh, <laughs> yep. uh you know, like, or, or the, or actually the Joker movie Joker. Right. I mean, I, I feel like there are, this is, um, you know, uh, right now, all I can feel like I can say is it's like a spiritual sibling to, uh, to Joker, but it definitely sort of tonally, uh, addresses, 
the mood that is going on in Gotham City right now. And I find that really compelling. Um, so I, I loved it. I agree with Pita. Um, I think that the, it also, his way of fighting was not balletic. Is that a word? Was not balletic. It wasn't very smooth. Thank you very much, but I'll watch myself, counselor. But he's just (laughs) such a blunt object. It reminded me of seeing, and I know that there's uh, differences of opinion about what makes a James Bond a James Bond, but when what's his name took over, as this blunt object, Daniel Craig, J- Daniel Craig that will just, mm-hmm. his main move is he will just hit you until you stop getting up. That's what this felt like. <laughs> and I thought it really, it just, I mean, and he announced himself pretty early on as vengeance. He's just unleashed rage that will do anything it takes to stop what's going on. Later on in the movie, I don't mean to skip ahead, but also this is a, this is a Batman that is afraid of heights. At one point, oh, I yes. love that he so runs much. to the top of this church and he's like, boy, oh, boy. And magically, oh. his cape doesn't let him fly. His cape's just a dumb cape. At one point in the movie, the cape becomes a hindrance. He's dragged by it uh, yeah. backwards in a fight. Instead, he has like a wingsuit. Everything. We're going to be talking about the grounded nature later. But yes, everything is really stripped down in a way that I think was exactly right. And I like that that connects with Pete's Tim Burton uh, comparison. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. I think that the, the, not only was the entrance, uh, the introduction well done, um, I found that I also had a little bit of a, I think whiplash is the wrong term. The right term is probably a, a very pleasantly surprised reaction to really shortly thereafter watching Jim Gordon bring Batman into a crime scene. You know, it's it's a regular crime scene. There's a there's a there's a, a dead body victim, and you have cops around taking pictures and you know doing what you would expect normal you know normal police officers to do in this situation. And Jim Gordon just walks in with the bat, and this guy dressed up as a bat just walks in. You know, and he walks in. He's looking around. You know, he's he's investigating uh, a crime scene. This was the first part of where I really started coming to grips with which type of Batman that we're going to get. And, and uh, that there was, uh, there are really what I think of as there are three kinds of Batman. And I'll just go off on my slight tangent and come back around to this scene in the movie. There, to me, there are three kinds of Batman that are typically depicted in, in entertainment and film. You, you really have your, your, your Saturday afternoon cartoon 60s TV show Batman, right? He's a fun character for kids with, and families. To, he stops bumbling criminals, uh, you know, from criming. And sometimes he dances. You know, and the second one is the superhero mission Batman, right? And this is usually when he's fighting villains on the Justice League level that he has no business fighting. Like he's fighting Darkseid, Steppenwolf, Brainiac, or the Predator. You know, just you know, all he has supreme <laughs> confidence in everything he does. He's able to do far more than he should with just some suit and the gadgets, right? There's that version. And then there's Detective Batman. And this is the one where the where the the Batman is focused on, you know, protecting Gotham through his really extreme means, because he's so rich, and then somewhat extreme and sometimes extreme measures. Um, you know, and his his mind is shown through the narration of either the you know the comic or the film. He has a conscious and he you know thinks about the ramifications of his decisions. And uh, these stories always feel the closest to reality to me. And so the when it really hit me at the first part of this movie was when he walks into a crime scene. And that that is like, oh, okay. Well, so if if someone were dressing up as a six foot bat running around protecting the city, this is how he would need to interact with the police to not be hunted down, you know. And so, and I, and I found that scene for me kind of a very pivotal and compelling as far as the, to let me understand what what it was I was about to watch for the next two and a half hours. Mm. Yeah, and and I think that's really a, a important thing to note. Like two two things. First, I think this is the first time we get an authentically cinematic detective Batman uh, than uh, yet. Like we we just all the other bats men have been, <laughs> you know, much more the adventure hero. Yes. You know, the I have an answer for everything kind of adventure hero. Even Batfleck, which was you know, there's always a technological answer to every right. threat. Um, and and this one, I, I feel like we have some great moments where he doesn't have answers <laughs> for stuff. Like, one, how do you stop the wingsuit besides maybe running into a bridge? <laughs> like, right. I, I think those kinds of moments were both, like, really authentic to who this character is, uh, played well, and 
uh, you know, fun nods to the fact that he doesn't have all the answers, you know, afraid of heights, you know, has to fly like those kinds of things, um, you, you know, and, and the fact that the flying bit was an emergency escape, not a tool, right? right. right? Because you, when you see the trailer, it's like a hero moment, right? There's that, oh, the, the he's swinging by that building. You get that one, but, and it looks like, oh, of course, because Batman can fly because of the cape and all that, whatever. This was, it, it was not that way in the movie. It was absolutely not. I, I really liked that touch. It's so aesthetically different, of course, but it reminded me a lot, and I believe this is the right one. Point out to me if it's not. It's the Mission Impossible where everything breaks. It's the one that I think J.J. Abrams did, maybe, or it's maybe the yeah. one. No, oh. it's the it's the one where he runs down the building. Yeah, the one where he's on yeah, in, Ghost in, Protocol. In the, yeah, mm -hmm. that was Ghost Protocol. The one where he has the gloves where he's trying to. Climb yes, the, and if you remember, yes, even yeah. from when he gets his mission and it says this will self destruct and it doesn't, and he kind of had yeah. to taps it. Every single yeah. thing doesn't work, and that really revitalized the series. That's the same kind of thing with this is everything is like really ground level having to figure it out the car is not a super tank nothing can really fly without falling down it's a neat it's a neat way to to it's it seems counterintuitive that stripping it down would revitalize it but it really seems to because it makes it have real stakes there's a real human involved instead of and i was even disappointed there's just one scene where he puts something magnetic onto something else and lights go beep, 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 and then something happens because nothing else is like that the most the biggest thing he has is like a a scissors that are on his chest and then a grappling hook and that's it and i was thrilled by that even his car seems just like an incredibly souped up regular car which is great like something that that you could yes. make. Yeah. I mean, yes. not you, but like no, me. You, you were right the made. first time. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. me. <laughs> Let me. Yes. You know, one of the no, things that, 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 that has been. Yeah. Well, one of the things that was such a such an easily lampoonable bit from I, I think from the Val Kilmer um, uh, ex experience was just how stupidly obvious it is that you know the the cowl when it comes off. Um, apparently has makeup cleaner in it and cleans <laughs> off his eyes because there are so many stupid cuts in that movie where he takes off the cowl, he has dark makeup on his eyes and then takes off the cowl and his eyes are perfectly yep. clean. And I, I, I think it, it ends up being a wonderful aesthetic choice in this movie to leave it on, to leave the makeup on so mm -hmm. much. Like we get so much of him to the point where in the final sequence, the third time he enters the, uh, uh, 44 below yeah. the, yeah, the yeah. refrigerator yes. penguins refrigerator club. Um, he goes in, he sneaks in, but you see him, he's already applied the dark makeup because he knows he's going to be putting the cowl on momentarily, but he's walking around this club with deep yeah. dark makeup around his eyes. I thought that was such a great touch. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Such a great touch and demonstrates that the audience doesn't need to, you know, be fooled. We, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also the, and you, you do have the benefit of that. That club was kind of sketched so he could walk around with that. And yeah. people would be he like, yeah, that's no big that. deal. Yeah. Again, yeah. because the yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. it's there. So um, the, the other part. So then in that with the, with the crime scene, you get the, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit uh, because I wanted to kind of just cover the introductions of the main characters. Right. And so the, the through that, you get the, 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 he gets the cipher from the, uh, which, I liked, and I was thought, pause for me here, they don't, at this point, you don't actually know who the big bad guy is. I mean, obviously, if you saw the trailer, you do. Mm -hmm. But from the movie, the movie has not yet told you who the, who the bad guy is. It, we're, just, we're just starting. You have a cipher. Um, I really appreciated that they demonstrated a different relationship with Alfred that Alfred was actually helping him solve things, right? That helping him decipher the, the because the, the, the card had the coded message and helping him decipher that, you know, and then working, really working together. And it took both of them together to figure out, okay, this is what is being, what is being communicated. And then they get the, you know, the scandalous pictures of the governor, which takes them to the club, uh, the club 44, I believe, no, it's called the iceberg club. Cause that's the main, the, the top yeah. club is the iceberg the club. 44 the 44 below is the, is club, the club down, downstairs. Yeah. yeah. The iceberg club. And so the that brings us to the introduction of the penguin. Um, so uh, hiding Colin Farrell under all the prosthetics was amazing. Um, but I think that part of that, the, what I really want to talk about there was that I found, and you mentioned it, the scene when he comes into 44 Blow the third time, I think the first time it is 
there's two things that I really find interesting. One is when they first set up the sight gag between the twins, um, which is a running gag each time he shows up uh, at 44 Blow about mm-hmm. how the twins treat him at the door. Um, the the interesting thing to me, the normalcy of the fight scene g- going in there, right, to get into get to the pink one. It's also the first time yep. where I started looking at like what his fighting style really was and also noticing that he was keeping to the Batman ethos of not killing people, right? Because he's in scenarios where he yep. can kill these people, but he's not. Yep. You know, his weaponry is all non-lethal. He's throwing them, even a couple times when you think he's throwing someone over a, a large, uh, over, over a, you know, like a balcony that's going to be a large drop, you realize, oh, it's only like about a little five-foot drop down to the next level, so they're going to have some broken bones, to be sure, but still be alive. Um, and so I think that it was interesting to me that th- that scene, and that sequence, uh, really reestablishing or continuing to establish his fighting style along with how then the penguin is introduced where he just walks up to him effectively and starts talking to him and and, and the batman and the penguin are, are talking to each other like the batman is a cop and the penguin is answering or, or evading his questions and and this to me was an interesting way to, to to set up and juxtapose not only like you know to set up who the penguin is but also batman's relationship with people in this and that he's just you know talking, you know, just, just talking, interrogating them and then, you know, talking to him, interrogating them. And so then I guess, what did you also, so I guess I'll start with you, Pete, did you also have any uh, thoughts or opinions about, about that interaction, about the, the normalcy of it? I think at this point I started to get, I started to get more grounded in the normalcy of things, but that you'd have that normalcy and you wouldn't have the whole, yes, I'm Batman. I'm going to swoop down and grab you and scare you and hang you upside down to interrogate you. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so. And, and I think particularly that nobody was surprised that people like the Penguin and the Batman and <laughs> the Catwoman and, you know, the, the Riddler are hanging out here. Like, <laughs> just as much as, uh, you know, as we have this sort of superhero movie, it's also just a messed up town. And it felt so normal for the town to be completely just bug nuts with characters doing things and and behaving in this way like that was just a normal thing um and and i think the penguin has always been kind of an interesting character because he's gone you know from the comics to the movies like he's gone from from being an industrialist to the mayor to you know to this underground you know raw fish eating uh (laughs) you know danny devito like there are all kinds of different uh, uh, interpretations, but one thing that the Penguin has always done is in his industriousness, he is able to move between worlds uh, uh, strangely efficiently and effectively. And here, we see him in the underworld, we see him in his club, and we also see him at the memorial, right, or getting getting up and out of the uh, out oh, of the right. car in front of the, you know, right. He he moves between worlds, I, I think, really in a compelling way. So, you know, notwithstanding the Colin Farrell performance here, which I thought was great, um, I I thought uh, I just really like the interpretation of the character here. I completely agree. Again, grounding is going to be the word that I use more than anything else, but that he's not... Yeah, that he doesn't eat fish. We're, 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 we're. <laughs> he did not one time. Not one time did he, did he, he eat a fish. fish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like what was said in, um, Split. The comics, that these things are real, and then the comics make such slightly more fantastical versions of everything. We're seeing it in reverse. Now that they're taking everything and it's as if, of course, he's not really a penguin and he lives in the sewer and eats things. We just call him that because of blankety blunk. And so like a lot of that stuff still carries over, but it's stripped down to its real humanness, which is, of course, exactly what I want out of every superhero <laughs> movie. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is great. I'm thrilled by that. Uh, and I think uh, I thought Colin Farrell was having a ball. He was so much fun to watch. Where do you stand on the overlay texting? We talked about this. Brian brought this question up in our pre-show chat, and I'm I think it's a really great question. Like, uh, you know, um, the way it was presented in that conversation was: is this a, a trend of taking you know great looking actors and covering up in in ugly latex? And and I think that was part of our. Uh, I think we we disagreed on that point that it's it's not necessarily a new thing. Like we're we've been doing this for a long time, latex. But in this case, he was unrecognizable. unrecognizable. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think it really comes down to. If the if they really knock it out of the park, so like Jared Leto and House of Gucci, I spend most of the time going, why, why spend yeah. so much time uglying up a beautiful 
person just so he can be like, oh, that's a spicy Gucci. I like, who cares? <laughs> no one enjoys that. But Colin Farrell was so lived in and so not Colin Farrell that I was like, sure. Absolutely. I'd love to yeah. see more of him in that role and the heavily latex. I say go for it. So that's where I think I draw the line. Yeah, I think the other juxtap- juxtaposition of the point was whether or not it was uh, taking um, work away from you know regular looking actors All right yeah you take the fa- the famous the famous big name pretty boy actor uh, ugly him up instead of using a, a a you know another character actor in this role it's a good point but he was so good in it there's a, i mean there there is a reason he's got like he he is a a supremely talented performer like he's really very good for this headlining role and uh, and so I, I think there is something just performative about it. Like he's he's here not because he's a a pretty guy who can't act. Right. 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 Like so I, there's one other thing that I just wanted to make sure it gets said. <clears throat> there is more Batman in this movie, I think, than any other movie we've ever seen. Like he, it, part of it is because of how grounded it is and how normal it is for him to wander around the city oh, in his suit all the time. I feel like it, if this were any other version of Batman, we would have seen much more Robert mm. Pattinson as Bruce Wayne and much less in the cowl. And so I, I wonder, I, and Tom, you sort of teased at that particular point that you didn't that one of those two you didn't like very much? Correct. I thought he was so good as Batman in the Batman outfit and stuff. Unfortunately, I don't know, and this could be the most petty thing ever, it might even just be his hair color or the way, but the way that they styled him as Bruce Wayne was too emo for me. He just sort of It was very much Spider-Man 3. I think so. He came off as like pouty, whereas Batman was like, I will eat a car for justice. Uh, what's his name? Just sort of seemed like a sad, pouty little rich kid, which I just, it didn't work for me. And I think part of it was his hair color and they would do that kind of draped across the eyes kind of thing. I just don't think they were doing him any favors by styling him like that. I think they should have styled him a little bit against type. You know, what's so interesting about that. I was listening to a, a wonderful review with Matt Reeves and I thought this was, this was particularly illustrative of his his sort of Bruce Wayne character design. Um, you remember the Safdie brothers, Good Time? Yeah. Did you see it? I loved it. Fantastic. Yes. I right. couldn't... I loved it. Uncut Gems is the most unpleasant movie I've ever seen in the entire world, but I loved I know, it Good was Time. rough. Yeah. 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 So Good Time is great, and that was another mm-hmm. Pattinson. And what is so amazing about that is, although he has this shock of blonde yeah. hair, it is also that kind of, of kind of shaggy emo look. And this interview with Matt Reeves, he says, you know, I, I actually, it was actually uh, Pattinson who is telling the story of the fact that his first meeting with Matt Reeves was he's working on this movie and had and just watched Good Time. And that's what gave Matt Reeves the idea that Pattinson could play this huh. part. He was like, this is the movie that modeled the character for this Bruce Wayne in, uh, Interesting. in the Batman. Sure. That, from a character design perspective, it suddenly makes a little bit more sense mm-hmm. to me that that this Bruce Wayne would have more than a passing resemblance <laughs> to, you know, that film. More of really kind of what you think you're reacting to is how he looked. Because uh, he wasn't, you know, pouty or emotionally, he wasn't, you know... Uh, tumultuous or anything with with his with his emotions throughout back and going back and forth to some wild swing or the other right he seemed to be pretty even keel most of the way through he seemed as bruce wayne you know <laughs> he's consistently full of self-loathing and yeah, yeah. But, but, yes. but he's not but he's not back and forth not like you because know, when you say emo, right. that makes him sound like you know like i guess maybe i think of that in terms of more uh you know happy sad if you're talking about emo just as in he was consistently depressed i think know, i, I mean, meant think more of just consistently depressed and okay, that's why okay. i said pouty yeah if emo is if i'm using that term incorrectly and that means wild swings of emotion 100 percent not no okay, i no. just mean sort of like Meh. Okay. Uh, and yeah. yeah, well, I mean, and that goes to the whole like reading his own journal as a narration. <laughs> yeah. That's a little bit of a low point for me. I really struggled yeah. with that. I'm like, I don't need you talking about how you feel about the city. I just just do your yeah. work, man. Like I that was a piece that I just sort of struggled with. So so, so in jumping ahead with that, well, let me jump onto the narrative part. Right. So you didn't feel that. Th- so that added a lot to me, not only in terms of the fact that the, you know, as I was saying earlier, for me, the detective Batman, a lot of those, especially in the comic book medium, a lot of it is. Is what's going on in his head, and mm. so they they had yeah. to then have a way. And narration is the only way is the way to 
you know, communicate that via film is like, okay, narration is going over. This is happening in his head. But, but also did, did you not feel that it had a payoff, you know, with the narration to, you know, towards the end, like as far as the, the, the change in the turn that is happening in his perception of what does it mean to be Batman is communicated to us through the narration of, of this exercise, you know, and I, and I felt that the, the early part, it needed to set the stakes for that. One, I'm sure Tom will have more to say on this subject. Okay. I'm, I hope I hope he has more to say. So I'm going to try to be brief. I prefer, I, I am generally an active antagonist for voiceover narration in film. I don't like it. I think movies are better without it. And as an alternative to voiceover narration, you demonstrate through performance and interaction with characters on screen, whatever the hell you want to have the character say in their head. In comics, we have call-out blocks. In movies, we have actors to do the work. And I generally find that hearing the narration, there are some examples where I think narration does uh, does actually work and some reasons when you might have it. I don't think this was one of them. Uh, and so I, I struggled with that. So I don't know. I, Tom, I, I, you've got something to say, please. Well, I wasn't able to see the film, but I think... <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, traditionally you're supposed to show, not tell. I do really like Ocean's point about that it really did hammer home not in a way that felt uh ham-handed but a way of in the beginning he's like darkness i am darkness i eat darkness and later he's like oh maybe everyone needs a hug like that worked for me but some of it was a little too hard bitten it wasn't as bad as like what was that movie oh reminiscence when he oh god you remember reminiscence yeah. when he's like oh, i walked in and so i saw bad. a bench and then i sat on the bench we're like well, we see you doing this in real wow, time you're sitting on yeah. a bench you dumbass. this no, i like the opening like the opening sequence he says i am vengeance and beats the crap out of a gang of thugs that tells me pretty well where his mind is <laughs> at the end of the movie he lights a flare and literally <laughs> leads the refugees to salvation after being cleansed by flood <laughs> A good I don't point. <laughs> need you to tell me that. They've shown me everything. <laughs> Shut him up. It, it was too much. I agree with Pete. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. It was too much. I didn't mind the, some of that opening. And I'm, I'm fine with the phrase, uh, they look for me in the dark darkness. They don't realize I am the darkness. Like, that's hitting you pretty square in the face. But that kind of hard-bitten line, I'm okay with. But there was an abundance. Since this Batman really was showing us a version where he did not know all of the answers of all the answers up front, right? Didn't know everything. Um, after you know, after meeting the ping, penguin, Selena Kyle's in, in the club. You know, follows her home, does stuff, right? So the the one thing though in, about that that I I find uh, that at least the next interesting point to, to me to discuss was um, about whether or not this film was actually trying to demonstrate a growth of the character Batman in, in, in increments. Okay. Cause there's the, we've talked about the beginning and the end a couple of times. And obviously there's the growth that pattern happens there, but even in increments of that, as interesting as it sounds, and I'll, and I'll set up my, I'll, I'll set up, I'll say what I'm saying. Then I'll set up the premise. As interesting as it sounds that a, a man that's dressed up fighting crime is a bat may have been naive slightly about the level of corruption of the city. And what I'm referencing that is the scenes when he starts to use Selena Kyle really as an informant to go under Dugan the first time she goes into the club and he sees, hey, that's the about the entire DA's office down here with, you know, um, because Falcone was down there. I think the Penguin was down there for a minute, you, you know, and there was various other uh, criminals, uh, criminals or low lives that they that they were mentioning when he was. Uh, identifying them through the the contact lenses that could that could you know that could video everything <laughs> right, and do the identification, which I thought was a, was a great was a great gadget trick. It was a great gadget in that it was, while not currently in our reality, it, it's it around the corner. All sorts of elements that were like, okay, yeah, I can see how you get there, and it, it allowed in a movie without very many gadget tricks. <laughs> right. Like that was that was a nice yeah, yes. Yes, just enough. Yeah, exactly, and, and so, and and in this, but in this sequence, in the scene where he's using her, and it's, it's kind of really they're working. He's now working the case. He's got a CI, and he's got to get the CI under to figure out what's how bad things are, you know. But and and that he a is still demonstrating the detective Batman thing, which I, I got to tell you, my mouth was agape for half the movie, just just how happy I was that this was what I was seeing. But then be yeah. that. 
in the in these moments when he's you know when he gets upset with Selena about like, you have a relationship with Falcone and all this other stuff, but the shock of the entire DA's office there is as if he thought it's like he was like, well, I thought Gotham was bad, but I didn't think it was that bad, right? And so that whether or not, did you feel that that was what the, another thing they're trying to display is incremental moments of growth as opposed to just giving us one big jump at the end. I didn't think about that as strongly until you just said that, but you're right. I think that we see a Bruce Wayne learning this town is filled with all of these little thugs and I have to run around and beat them up, but he's not questioning why is this town filled with so many little thugs. It's because it's systemic and it's coming from the top. It goes all the way up and everything is built on lies. That says a lot about also, you know, America, well, probably worldwide, but certainly American anxieties currently. Um, and about distrust in politicians, distrust in a lot of things. That's another yeah. uh, handshake with the Joker, like Pete was talking about before, not the character, the, the movie. Uh, that really, mm-hmm. these movies are starting to, while Aquaman is smelling his own armpit underwater, these movies are really starting to address what it, are we all in Gotham? <laughs> and how do, how do you know when you're officially in Gotham and you're not watching a movie anymore? So yeah, I think that's really, that's a good point. I like that. I there the the um, urban dictionary definition when you look up idiocracy is the documentary that became or movie. the movie that became a documentary right. and I I feel like that's that's funny only to a a, a certain place this and joker and like I think that's the same thing could be said, right? The the movie that's becoming a documentary. I mean, this is a movie that deals with groupthink and the in you know using media to to you know uh, cause you know certain um, elements to to rise up and and those sorts of things are scary and dangerous and and one of the great fears of this movie is mob mentality, mm-hmm. right? It's that that they use the mob as the big bad. And uh, I I think that was that was super terrifying. Um, You know, it's also like there are so many other things woven into it. And I can't believe we've gotten this far. and We haven't talked about Paul Dano as the Riddler, because when you talk about the opening of the movie, that is an incredibly powerful scene, that initial mayoral murder, uh, that candidate murder uh, in in the movie. And it has so many nods to so many other wonderful (laughs) other movies the way we meet him and we've already talked about batman coming out of the darkness here we have you know the this him in the darkness right these these incredible visuals of him in those shining reflections off his off his glasses right the the um um wow man what was that there was a, another really great movie from the 70s that had another one of those great i mean there are great scenes like this all the time but it's when the the murderer is like in the room and behind you and you can't see him until he moves a little bit well halloween um, was a big one i know that's not the one you're thinking halloween, of but halloween you yeah halloween's definitely one uh when a stranger calls, Ooh, when a stranger calls good the, the babysitter one yep. right yep. right so it, it's that kind of a of a move that i, I think they he, they execute so perfectly. And then to extrapolate that as like that this this broken, this other broken soldier mm-hmm. is the thing that exacerbates the 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 long sort of the long con of the failure of of Gotham City, I think was incredibly powerful. I think that that worked really, really well, starting from this single uh, murder to the final gag of all of these guys hanging off of the scaffolding right. with their rifles was terrifying and and felt earned to me. I don't know. I probably totally derailed the question no. notion. I just had to. I had to vomit a lot of stuff out there. No, you did not. Actually, that was that was going to be the next thing I was going to, uh, to, to talk about as well because we hadn't talked about pa- Paul Dano and his uh, his performance portrayal as a Riddler. Um, you, you know, and and then I guess my one of the things I was curious about. So I know that. Well, I'm I'm in the tank. Read lots of comics. Love Batman. I know Pete reads a lot of comics with Batman as well. And I know Pete, you don't. So, having had potentially a little bit lesser of experiences with the various different different versions of the Riddler, what was your impressions of this one? I'm going to guess he was talking to you. Yeah, you said yes. Pete twice, but you were talking Did to I me the whole time. Twice? Yes. So I yes. have so, yes. read yes. a the the superhero that I have. Like if no, I don't have a bookcase. Up filled with graphic novels. I was pointing to my. I was pointing <laughs> to my free weights. That, um, that's like your bathroom. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, I do have a graphic novel thing, and the bees are all Batman. Like I don't read a single other serial 
uh, wow. superhero, okay. but Batman I've read a fair amount of. I started with Frank Miller, and then I've read a lot of like Brian Azzarello and Loeb and Hush and The Long Halloween, The Killing Joke. Like I know a fair a lot about these. What I loved in this was oh, I'm I'm sorry. Then uh, let me restate my question. So uh, so Tommy, as an expert in all <laughs> things Batman comics and understanding all of the uh, Batman lore and history, uh, you know from uh, from uh, Miller yeah. to Loeb. Uh, yeah. To, to others that have tried to compete with them. Uh, what did you think of this version of the Riddler? I loved how scary it was. One of my favorite properties in all of Batman is Arkham Asylum, um, where you get to meet all yeah, of the... Actually, there's like three or four that are based in Arkham Asylum, but Arkham Asylum is the main one. Yeah. And yeah, the Riddler should be scary. I never quite understood the idea of the Riddler being like... <laughs> Um, it's because the doctor was a woman. I guess that's not really a riddle, yeah. but I like the idea of using this type of riddles and puzzles. Yeah, because what it connects it to and what I actually, when I, I saw this yesterday and I came home and after dinner, I started watching Seven. Seven oh, is yeah. such a spiritual cousin, to reuse Pete's, Pete's phrase, to this movie that, yeah, that's a riddle that puzzles can be really dangerous. And, and that's been found out in so many horror movies, from Saw to Escape Room to all of those. Puzzles can be really devious. And so um, I was thrilled by this. Paul Dano's performance really worked and then sometimes really didn't for me. I don't feel like he really decided on a voice. And I think I mean that literally. It seemed like he mm. was happy, and maybe that's a part of his process, because I love his him as an actor. I think he's incessantly fascinating. It seemed like he was sort of figuring it out throughout the movie. Uh, but either way, I overall, I was uh, blown away by this depiction of the Riddler. This is what I want. I want Batman villains to be scary. I'm, I'm a little bit spoiled because I spent a lot of time in Gotham in Gotham. Uh, and in that show, oh, I've never seen it. The Riddler was played by Corey Michael Smith. And so, and, and he was fantastic in really dealing with the, the sort of multiple personality disorder mm. that, that he, uh, that, that they've sort of imbued on, um, on, Nigma here and the, the the kinds of nods that they took from the source books. I think they did an incredible job with him. I think Paul Dano, I'm with you. I think he's endlessly fascinating. And talk about a guy who knows his tool. Like yeah. his face is fascinating. And I found it incredibly unnerving when they arrested him and they put his face down on the Ooh, diner smile. counter. That smile, the way his, it, it was like a morph. It was like an old school morph effect as the smile kind of came. It's like he has no texture on his face and he knew how to move his face without making any wrinkles at all. And I thought that was yeah. horrifying and perfect. Just perfect. I, I get what you mean about the voice. I didn't have that. That didn't bother me okay. so much. I think the real highlight is when he um, is when they're, they're having the confrontation between the glass and, and um, you know, Batman sets him off and he starts walking around Wailing. the table. Oh, no, yeah. no, no. I thought that was really powerful and sort of demonstrates like where he is on the spectrum, right? Hmm. He's he's having an outburst. Like he can't, he can't control himself. And I thought that was, uh, I, I thought that was really good. I liked him a lot. Um, and I thought he was, you know, a, a return to form that was cleansing from the 60s version of, mm. the, of the Riddler, who was also, what was that Frank Gorshin? Yep. Like, they're, they're also a, an iconic performance, but only really appropriate for that property. Right. And right. I think we, we it, it came undone when Jim Carrey had it and, and just did all of the Jim Carrey stuff all right. over it and <laughs> didn't really move it along. It. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I found that uh, for me uh, the you know you alluded to the end sequence, and I think the end sequence, the movie uh, confirms what my bias in a sense was. That um, what I found interesting about this incarnation of the Riddler is, um, and really I'm saying the Riddler, but I think I could even that has have that as a stand-in for a, any Batman villain I've seen in in cinema, where it's that the he a he seems to be smarter. Uh, you know, and like it's, it's a smarter, well, more put together villain. Like it's actually a plan that has, you know, seems to have a point A, a point B, a direction of where we're going. But the, the thing that I found inter most interesting was that as the Riddler's motivation becomes clearer, I started to ask myself 
is the killing alone the difference between him and Batman? You know, because if you th- if you look at what the Riddler's doing, it's like, well, while Batman would not have chosen these methods with the armed with the same information, he would have tried to come up with the, a similar outcome. Now, granted, the people wouldn't be dead. Right. He wouldn't have killed the mayor. He wouldn't have killed the DA, um, you know, and he wouldn't have killed. He wouldn't have broken the seawall and destroyed the city. That's also not that part. Not that part. Up to there. You just <laughs> mean, no, because it, it breaks down <laughs> at that part. Uh, it, breaks but, down, it breaks down there. But but like everything up to that, because this is all my thoughts of, of everything up to their conversation in the in the uh, jail cell before he breaks the seal, the sea, the seawall, because, yes. Batman wouldn't do that. But the rest of it, as far as really viewing Gotham as a cesspool of corruption that needs to be fixed and there needs to be no more lies, really the Riddler was, I think, two things. One, he was really kind of, it felt to me, the other side of Batman, where it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a darker side that's not willing to really value life to achieve goals. But then also, B, kind of was smart enough to figure out, hey, I need, I need this Batman forced to make what I want to make happen, happen. And, and I found that, that duality very interesting. And then also questioning, well, you know, th- how different are they? And I, and, I, and I applaud the movie for making, really making this question become something that you think about was, okay, well, what is the real difference between Batman and the Riddler in this movie uh, up to the, up to the seawall? Yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. I love that too, but I feel like that was really explored also in uh, Christopher Nolan's batmans that a lot of the times especially with the joker that they're in in the comics there's a lot of there's no difference between us <laughs> there's no difference between him and some of the bad guys and they're trying to like force him to recognize that and the joker when he's like trying to get batman to kill him over and over again in order to prove the point and batman at the last second tanks his motorcycle or just over and over again he puts himself in harm's way granted the joker's also a a bug nuts like pete so eloquently said before (laughs) but i think that's always that's always sort of a big part of it i think that's different you think think it's different different, though i think it's really important yeah give me a let me just give me a a chance to respond Uh, two minutes Mm. on the clock i feel like uh the the difference joker as a foil to batman is uh, it is a the the uh, order as the antithesis of chaos, right? Joker is chaos. He has no motivation other than being chaos, and Batman is all order. The difference here, and why this is so fascinating to me, is that the Riddler is the same as Joker er, as Batman. He is equipped with the same intellect, the same, and, and has a motivation beyond chaos. The Riddler wanted to get to the bottom of the crime. He wanted to get to the bottom of the mob, uh, you know, death of his own father and the, you know, all of that. Like, he had motivation beyond, let's just sow dissent. And that that is such a different take on this character. And and I do think on the reflection between the two, and to Ocean's point, this whole idea that they they really are the same, the same, they, with, you know, just one little tiny thing that Batman doesn't like to kill people. Like, they really are going for the same ends. Agreed. That's why that speech at the end was so powerful when he said, you know, we're working together. (laughs) I needed you to do this, man. You didn't need me to do this. He actually makes Batman look like the Joker in this relationship. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I got so excited I spit on my computer. (laughs) Uh, since we really kind of jumped closer to the ending, and and so uh, we haven't really talked too much about that, you know, the process of that they were d- discovering that Falcone was the real informant against Maroney, right? And that they they did do one thing with that that I did appreciate is I was happy to see the first actor portraying a Batman for the first time in a Batman movie where we don't have to cover like his parents getting killed. Right. And what I mean by that is you can reference it. And I think that's appropriate because if your parents get killed, you can talk about it in conversation. But we don't have to show it over and over again in the movie. And any time we get these reboot type Batman, you know, they they, you got to show that that his parents were killed all the time. So they didn't do that. But then also, well, um, real quick, I really disagree because the whole movie I was like, was his mom wearing pearls? 
So, <laughs> they ne- I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, and I do like that. You know, so the movie felt to me that it had, uh, you know, that the uh, the two the two endings. Okay. So there's the the one ending which we really already discussed, which was you know once he discovers Falcon is the real informant uh, against Maroni, then the Riddler has him killed, and they and goes to the sequence that we talked about in the in the prison, uh, and then the the second is the blowing up of the seawall. Right where where that is, you know, it creates the water flooding and then the killing and then getting uh, leveraging, you know, modern technology of you know social media to say, hey, I have a group of I think there was maybe twenty or thirty of them that were willing to then cook fifty. Oh, it was a fifty. Okay, that were willing to go up yeah. on the top and basically turn the. Uh, it was. Gotham Square Garden. I remember. I remember. I remember. Keep thinking. Okay, that's not Madison Square Garden, but it is right. Madison Square Garden. So yes, yeah, okay. they they want it to be real. Exactly. Bad. Yes. So that in Gotham Square Garden to have them, you know, the uh, to have them, you know, turn that into a shooting gallery to to kill various people, and also uh, that. Effective turn of Batman, where he um, not only helps save, that's the one sequence, the one sequence where a bunch of explosions and he swoops down to, to, to fight as opposed to right. like walking in somewhere, you know, which in this case, warranted. I think that's earned. It's, it's mm-hmm. warranted. You know, that's where he swoops down and comes down to that. And, and that yep. it also leads to the, a couple, two or three things about the touching sequence of not only him rescuing people and really becoming Batman that is saving people as opposed to Batman who was just punishing criminals. Right. And, and so, uh, and it was it's curious from your, um, so I guess your perspective, Tom, what you thought of what I really felt were two endings because this movie could have ended at, after the jail scene and we'd have been fine. Right. But they, but to say, oh, you know, to have the Riddler say, okay, there's something else, and then you have this other sequence, you know, that kind of what you thought of that, did that seem in or out of character? Because it was kind of a, we're going to do, we're going to do away with everything in Gotham, and it was a bit, it was a bit much, you know, for the scale of everything. And so, I don't know, did you, did you, did you have that feeling of that we had two endings, or did you feel that that one, the conversation led in extra, you know, inexorably into this, which was the actual ending. I felt that we, there was definitely two endings, but I really was struck by the amount of damage that was done to Gotham, that the seawall really did. One of the problems I have with Siri, with uh, super, Super Bowl, serial or Super Bowl. Those are the two choices with superhero <laughs> movies is everything just goes back to normal. Right. Everything's just like, oh, well, we put this one person. He's like, oh, yeah, I would have done it except for you. That there's there. this was really real stakes. And a lot of people were probably caught out in that flood. Um, I like the idea of having someone so dangerous, having two things, so much corruption from the people that are supposed to be protecting the city, and then someone so dangerous and able to weaponize the mob as um, the Riddler is, that there should be repercussions for that. Everything shouldn't, the sun just shouldn't go up the next day and go, phew, that was a close one. The city is a wound and it needs to feel like one was really inflicted on it. So I, that made stakes for me. I couldn't believe it. When it started going off, I was blown away. Oh, that seems like I was trying to make a, a pun. I was absolutely not. Yeah. But my emotional seawall. All expectations were just walked yeah, away. My emotional seawall was breached. Um, and so. <laughs> No, I'm really glad that they put that in because it makes it seem that's weirdly, even though that's so much bigger than so much of the rest of the movie, that also grounds it for me. When bombs blow up, horrible things happen. Things don't just, you don't just send someone to jail and everyone gets up and eats breakfast the next morning. So I liked it. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful about the, the irony of his interpersonal transformation is that like that cleansing like he wouldn't be, he he has evolved a little bit as a result of this movie. We need to see that because this is year two, right? Like this is his, he's still so new at this whole thing that we need to see him learn a lesson. And this is a massive failing. Mm-hmm. This is, he as a savior of the city is unable to save the city. He's not able to defuse the bomb in time. And if you know, I have complained many times before about the video games that, all you have to do is race around the digital city and defuse mm-hmm. bombs like Batman Arkham Asylum. I played that. Which frustrated me to no end. This movie was like me playing Batman. You failed right. 
to stop the yeah. bombs because that's a stupid mechanic. But also, it allows him to be cleansed in the waters. And I think that that was really powerful. And And as a result of that, when he falls into the water and he stands up and he lights the flare, that is like the hero right. shot of this movie. They use it in the trailer, unfortunately, but it is like the poster I want of this mm. movie, of him holding it o over his head, like he's under, kind of under the light, but it is glowing around him, and then the the shot from up above, which reminded me of the um, uh, Wolverine, the arrow shot in oh. the Wolverine that we love so much, right? With all the arrows, he's right. like leading the, the you know, across the the uh, flood, which I thought was extraordinarily visually beautiful, mm -hmm. like just so beautiful. So what else did you um, think about in terms of uh, obviously this in this? I guess maybe this is what I like to segue into this part with the so we talked about the scale of the final explosion, um, just how uh, sorry explosion the flooding and all that in terms of like you know how how was, you know Pete did you feel about you know the how was how the movie was made like the look and feel the whole the whole production production design of the whole thing you know that did this was this the penultimate piece of it for you or did you find that it was really just of a piece of what you'd been seeing the whole time. Well, I do think it was of a piece of what I was of, of what I've been seeing, with the exception of Wayne Manor, which I thought was just goofy. <laughs> like, it was just too much. Yeah. It was just too flamboyant, too many fleur de lis. Like it was, <laughs> I that was just ridiculous. Like I, it was just a, a bridge way, way, way too far. However, speaking of the groundedness of, uh, you know. Bruce or of of the Batman, the fact that his lair uh, is in this old subway tunnel. There, there's something about being in the subway tunnel versus being in a mm -hmm. cave. The subway tunnel feels, ironically, more grounded to me because it is like a piece of of Anthropocene refuse. Mm -hmm. Like it is a thing that humans created and then like just. Uh, disposed of, like closed it off, and it's it's just trash. And and I thought that was that was just weirdly like resonant for me. Not like oh look, I found this giant thing in the in underground under my house, and <laughs> thank God I'm going to build an elevator slide to it behind the clock, and now it's going to be perfect right. and with computers. Because well, building like, a base, I was going to say. But first, I need a a plaque with the head that I can tilt up and hit a button to open yeah. the door to get down. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that's right. Hands <laughs> down, right. So I just think it it just really lended itself to the the overall tone. I think there were some really smart decisions all the way around. Tommy already mentioned the car, the fact that I I love the motorcycle sequences, uh, you know, with when the Batman and the Catwoman are riding their motorcycles side by side. I thought that was really cool. Like there's just so many smart smart choices that made it feel like a universe that could exist. Um and may someday soon exist, but right now it was it was a playground. Agreed, agreed. Good, good. So, um, the, the, I think that it would be remiss before we uh, uh, for before, before we wrap all this up to say I wanted to say a couple of things. One, John Turturro was amazing mm -hmm. uh, as as yep. Falcon. I thought I thought his his performance was uh, a, a mixture of cool and dangerous. You know, all all at the same time. Well, it goes, it goes a long way for the story, too, to make the big bads the mob and not some weird, you know, super powered creature yes. person like it is really grounding yeah. Yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. And the, the other thing that I um, was curious if, if you um, felt that this was a difference as well, that was it's a good or a bad difference, Tommy, in that. The, there's the scene which we, we skipped over, but there's a scene where Alfred is in the hospital. Mm -hmm. and injured and and he and Bruce Wayne have that moment that is more emotionally affecting where you know historically especially especially in film Alfred is treated as in you know there's a little bit of a reverence to him uh, there's it you know it's obvious that Bruce Wayne you know loves Alfred and feels that he owes him so much but not anything like this where it was the, you know kind of a a moment like a slight moment of almost at least as most as much as much vulnerability as Bruce Wayne is going to allow in his life to say, Hey, I would really my life would be uh really in a lesser place if, if I lost you. You know, and whether or not you did you feel that that was uh, you know, I guess do you think of that as a good thing, you know, that we're showing different sides of, of Bruce Wayne Batman, or is it a bad thing of I don't need this much I don't need this much touchy feely out of my Batman. Uh, I liked it because it really solidified more, less of the help and more of the father figure 
that he is, that he always sort of has been, but always sort of in, a, especially with like Michael Caine is like a disapproving, here's your tea and you should go find a nice girl and settle down thing. He really just seems like a guy that he's living with, uh, that he's known for his entire life. So um, I thought it was an important scene in just another way that he's been, everything in this movie is a huge p- pyramid of lies. And that, that includes Alfred to Batman. To, sorry, Bruce Wayne. And so I think having that also in there, it's everything is touched by lies in this movie. And so I enjoyed that being a part of it. Yeah, I I seriously, with that, although I did find myself coming down on the, I don't think Falcone had the Waynes killed. Yeah, I I think it was, I think it was random. Even though they, even though they hint towards that in there that he potentially did. I I think, I think it was random. I'm just going to just my claim there. Just incredible timing. Uh, I think somewhat incredible timing, but also the the that they do still mention it as if it was still like a a random street thug kind of yeah. thing did it, and it wasn't like a professional hit job. You know, that I think that if Falcone had had it done, it would have been cleaner than oh, that's than interesting what, than, than what they're describing. What, right? Why would he hire one of the, the Joker's goons to do it? That's an interesting point. Yeah, well, you, yeah, yeah. Well, not the okay. Yes, but yeah. So some. So I think more on that. So um, I guess though, is there since we've this has this movie has a lot, and we talked about a lot of things. Are there any uh, acting performances or anything else we, that we haven't talked about yet that you want to touch on, Pete? Well, I I I want to talk about Zoe Kravitz. Oh my okay. gosh, just a yes. little bit, and I want to talk about Zoe Kravitz because the last time I can't I think this was the last time we talked about a Zoe Kravitz movie on the show was a long long time ago. Uh, it was Divergence. Oh, oh. Um, and I said. On that show, I she said, would make a great hey. Catwoman, and we were like, "Boo!" <laughs> I said something to the effect of, uh, "I I found her compelling." It was like the first thing I'd ever seen her in, and I said, "I found her compelling. I would like to see more things with her in it." It was Insurgent. We did. It was when we did Insurgent. That's the one where they jump across the train yep. track, mm-hmm. and um, and I I said I'd like to see more in it. And I think somebody who somebody was on that show, it might have been you, Tom, laughed at me. And said, "Oh, you know, it's like in, you know, she's nepotistic casting or something." I wasn't on I'm that. Not, I'm blaming I, you only because I wasn't you're on here. that episode. I did just. I sent you a. Then good, you're a perfect vessel. Oh, okay, <laughs> you're sticking with it. Yeah, yeah. What a you're, jerk you're I a am. Patsy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, I have recently been complaining about a movie that she was in that is Kimmy because it was not great, but she was good right. in it. I feel like this performance from her is something that uh, is it, it it completes the circle for me of of her as a young actor. I think she is really, really good, and um, and I think her Catwoman was interesting and motivated and made some interesting choices and was appropriately uh, physical. Like mm-hmm. I, the way she left her apartment was yeah. dope, yeah. 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 right? Yeah. Like that was so cool. And like, what a great effect stunt sequence, like super effortless little choices that she made. Uh, and so I actually, I think she was a great addition to the the Catwoman Legion, better than Michelle Pfeiffer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I I think, in my opinion. The other thing I want to say about Robert Pattinson is it's interesting because I've been reading a lot about, uh, you know, I, I really like Robert Pattinson a lot. And I think it's it is Very um, it's easy for people to. I, we all heard that. <laughs> We all, we what, all. Why did you, why did you marry him, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I actually did that quiet enough where nobody heard it. <laughs> yeah. Nope. We all <laughs> heard it. Okay. So anyway, I think there are a lot of uh, people who are like, oh, look, the Edward Cullen, the Twilight guy, is now Batman. Nah. But please, no. people who are doing that, go look at the rest of the stuff that he's been doing since then, because yeah. he makes some crazy yes. choices. That guy does just makes heavy swings yep. with everything that he that does. That sci-fi and, and movie look with at, Claire yeah, Tennant. Oh. Tennant was amazing. He was great in that. He was great in Tennant. Tennant was um, amazing. Cosmopolis. Yep. High, a, a good time. High uh, life. Go, please High. go watch The Lighthouse. Mm. My God, yeah. that movie. You talk about a guy who just is, un, it, it feels like he is just unafraid to do anything. Yep. And this is just another thing. Although, he is also in Twilight, a brooding, self-loathing <laughs> yes. uh, character. Yeah, I, so this is probably the closest he's ever been to yeah, coming back yeah, to that. Yeah. Uh, I, really, I also like that he wasn't fully jacked. Like, yep. he didn't put on 40 pounds of solid muscle. He, he still looked like a, a guy. 
I found that almost a little dis- uh, a little odd. Um, uh, there were times when uh, the only moment of not full believability I had in him as Batman was when they showed him with the shirt off. There was one they had him in the front where it looked like okay, maybe he you know seen a couple of dumbbells, um, but that yeah. that he was he appeared to me too small, and so. That part of it, I was kind of just <laughs> going to go with a bit um, whenever yeah. they showed him with it. Because in the suit, you don't get that impression. He's so much taller. Exactly. And he's you know, big and he's kind of wildly and lanky. But when they started showing him with the shirt off, I was like, well, that, that dude's too small. Uh, <laughs> he, so, was, he was fit, not correct, jacked. Correct. Yes. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Also he, known he as the Tommy Hitz. like... Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> he was a, yeah, you don't, you weirdly don't know what the Tommy Hansen is. Uh, <laughs> I, I think he, uh, I, I think he actually, I, I think there's a, there might be a case to be made that that was also performative, that he's a little too skinny because he was, uh, that is one character thing I get out of him, that he was sort of suffering for his craft. Like clearly when Af- Alfred comes down, he's like, this, you have to take care of yourself, man. You've got to sleep. You've got to do some things. You got to eat right. You got to you got to take care of yourself. And he was having none of it. And that that I I felt like okay, I get that he might look a little starved, uh, you know, because he's not healthy. <laughs> well, you know, insomnia, uh, jumping around on rooftops yeah, and right. chasing criminals will do that to you. The uh, Michael Giacchino did the score, and it's fantastic. Yeah. He is he quickly became one of my very favorite uh, working composers and this movie is just yet another wonderful contribution it's just great right. so i'll start with you tommy so uh let's talk about given your expectations going in did this movie uh meet exceed or not or not meet uh the, your, your expectations exceed it was as gritty and dark and thuddingly blunt instrument as i thought it would be but it was also smarter the use of the riddles was really good and even kind of like gorily funny at times. Uh, it really made me want to rewatch seven uh, because it, it has at times levels of that complexity where when you see, when you sit back and you see the whole picture, you really kind of want to go back and see it again. So it exceeded. I was thrilled. Yeah, it, it exceeded uh, for sure. And and it took me, I think it took me the day to realize how much I liked and appreciate the take on this movie. Like I walked out of it and at a three hour runtime, it's a, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know about you guys, but there were easily, I mean, I, more trailers for this before this movie than I had ever seen. So it was more than 30 mm-hmm. minutes yeah. of straight previews before the movie started closer to 40. And uh, by the, so by the time you're at the end of the movie, it's like four hours sitting uh, in, in the theater, and so it's it's a lot of of darkness and rain, so much rain, uh, and so I it, I think I was a little bit uh, <laughs> over overstimulated when I walked out, and, and after kind of sleeping on it, I, I realized this is they made a lot of really smart choices, and not only that, I can't wait to see it again. I'm yeah. really looking forward to seeing yeah. it again. In the theater. I want to yeah. see overstimulated post-Batman Pete. <laughs> I need to get my parking validated! <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. That, that, he drives home very quickly. And uh, looks, yeah. more, looks for uh, a little bit of trucks. Uh, that, you know, those car carrier True. ones that you can then jump it up and over and through. <laughs> like that and everything. That was a great, that was a great scene. I thought that was a really interesting thing with the, uh, that, the, the actual car mm-hmm. case. Yeah. The car, first of all, you already mentioned, is incredibly threatening with all the flames yeah. and stuff, like super souped up. Apparently, largely indestructible, drives through that concrete, you know, <laughs> piping. Uh, but uh, also really unsettling. Like they never give you a solid master shot of the entire sequence, so you actually have any way to see what's going on. It's just a lot of weird traffic, yeah. like uh, and so much rain that it was. I, I found it really unsettling. I I have read folks who did not like it who felt like it was just sloppy and choppy, oh. and, and I didn't get that read on it at all. To me, it felt like intentional yeah uh, you yeah. know uh, that was, it had my choices. favorite shot in the movie of a movie that is absolutely beautiful and filled with shots is when it's you're going the uh penguin is driving away from us and we're behind him and the batmobile squeals into traffic all the way outside of frame the camera does not follow yeah. him and then back in that's dope i haven't seen that in a long time because the camera always follows uh, but it made it so much better to not follow. I thought it was great. 
Well, and and you know he did so many things that were that felt very cl- like uh, all the way back to like Cloverfield type mm-hmm. stuff. You know, like it was it's very much the uh, like uh, Kyle Olson uh, wrote me a text. He was like, you know, this movie takes GoPro to a new level. <laughs> yeah. Like where they put the camera, yep. like on the side of his hel- hel- of his cowl, shooting up into the right. sky. Like I, just really cool yeah. use of placement of cameras. So right. anyway, we're trying to end. Yeah. Okay, okay. so uh, for me, this movie uh, exceeded my expectations. I was already coming in hot and this was great. Um, I think that uh, on the, the, the on a high level, I haven't decided yet if this is my favorite or second favorite of the Batman movies. This movie is The Dark Knight, which I, uh, b- which you can trust that in the next week I'm going to watch them back to back and figure that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so the, <laughs> I don't know which one it is. But I found that, so there's the opinion about which movie it is that I think is the best Batman movie. But I think that, and I'm saying the word objectively, and this might be subjectively, but I think objectively, this is the best Batman movie in this specific way. Many Batman movies, right, are good or bad based. So let's just throw out Batman and Robin and Batman Forever because that was just Drek. But most of the other Batman movies, how much you like or dislike them, a lot of times pivots a lot on the villain, you know, and that what you really remember. So, you know, the, the, the easy one, of course, is the Batman 89, both Batman 89 and uh, the Dark Knight. What you remember predominantly is those performances of the Joker. That's what is great. Batman is there. Batman Returns, again, I thought was a really good performance by Michael Keaton, but still the combination of the villains that you had there with the Catwoman and the Penguin and really Christopher Walken with Max Schreck. Let's not forget anything Christopher Walken does because Christopher Walken's amazing. Um, you know, those things, it, it, it's that combination to uh, you know, and, and even with the Christopher Nolan ones, where you had with both either Tom Hardy and um, oh, good, Liam Neeson, I was gonna say Qui Gon Jinn, uh, with, uh, with <laughs> Liam Neeson as Ra's al Ghul and Tom Hardy. You know how much you like or dislike those. I think Christian Bale's performances is, is even kill. How much you like or dislike those depends a lot about what you thought about how those villains were portrayed. And all of that long winded preamble was to say that in this instance, the greatness of this movie rests solely on what I thought of the guy playing Batman. The, 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 when I think about this movie, I think about Batman. When I, and I know when I think about this movie years from now, I'm, I'm going to like it or hate it based on the guy playing Batman. The Riddler, while important and, and very consequential in this movie, I'm not, I, I'm not walking away thinking about, oh man, Paul Dan, Paul Dan was great. It's like, no, this was Robert Pattinson doing a great performance as the Batman. And this movie was really more focused on the Batman as, as a character and as his journey and not just the Batman has to stop X. So we need to focus a lot on what X is so we understand what the Batman is going to stop, right? When this scenario, it was, it was the Batman. And so I felt that in that vein, it, it gave me something, what I consider very special of that, hey, this movie really is a Batman movie first. Why don't you marry it? <laughs> um, because uh, he's 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 emotionally unavailable. I got it. Um, turns out, the, yeah, there's there's been there's been others that have tried, and as, as pretty as I am, I'm yeah. not as pretty as Zoe Kravitz. So I think that if, if she enough. couldn't get him to leave the city, because yeah. I'm telling you, if Zoe Kravitz is like, hey, let's just leave the city and go off here and live somewhere. I mean, look, I'm going to give it a lot more thought than he did. So, <laughs> I'm going to be like, yeah, let's go. So okay, so just one more thing. I know we're trying to end here, but I just have just just one more thing, much like the one more thing in this movie, which is our trip to Arkham. Uh, love the setup of Arkham. Love that Arkham is named after uh, Bruce's mother, uh, mother's family, like that there is they've introduced a lot of, you know, uh, potential for emotional uh, distress and uh, instability uh, and Bruce Wayne is probably subject to some of that himself. And uh, here we go for the first time into Arkham and we see this is where they have sent the Riddler and he happens to be in a cell next door with a a laughing manic uh, new best friend. And that is, as we are uh, 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 come to find out, uh, 
Barry Keegan uh, was cast as the Joker. Not yet the Joker. He is, this is, again, year two of Batman. Um, he's not quite yet the Joker, but he does start to have the the mannerisms of the Joker, etc. It's kind of a big cast uh, for this particular character, for this part. According to Reeves, uh, he was, there was another scene that was cut oh. that actually was with Barry Keegan as the Joker. Uh, and it was cut from the film. So that makes it look even more stunty. He adds, Matt Reeves, that this is not an indicator of a potential sequel to come that will star the Riddler and the Joker. <laughs> like there is, he's been very careful about staging his comments around it. We're just introducing the rogues gallery right. and that's the, the Joker is in universe. And this is a thing that, you know, may eventually come to play. That doesn't mean that it's our next uh, outing with this character. He really is trying to build a universe out of his particular take on this Gotham and this Batman. And so, you know, hopefully we'll, we, we will see more, but we should not get our hopes up that it's going to be a Joker movie. Given all of that, how does that last scene hit you? Uh, I liked it because as we're seeing Batman evolving, we're also seeing the villains evolve mm -hmm. teaming up but things aren't going away again that's that same sort of feeling of why i liked that the floodwaters really did hit is there's when you put someone in jail they don't just disappear so yeah. i was a big fan i liked it okay and as the counterpoint i totally hated it no! i thought that it should not have been in the movie at all <laughs> we had a great movie it was great batman the riddler was perfect on his own i don't need the stunt crap of the joker showing up at the end of the movie he showed up at the end of batman begins and that was not necessary and it's not necessary here there are batman has a massive great rogues gallery is the Joker number one on that list with a bullet? Absolutely. Right. And so if you make a second movie and you put him in, fine. Well, we will all accept it. We will all love it. It is great. The Joker's amazing. You don't need to tease the Joker. Okay. You, <laughs> so to, to throw him at the end of some other movie is a horrible idea. And I want the directors of any Batman movie to stop doing it. Either the Joker's the villain or he's not in the movie. Those are your options. I, you know, Ocean, I think uh, on this point, we agree. Maybe not quite so violently <laughs> agree, but I, but, but I think we agree. And, it, and I, for that very reason, I'm sort of tired of Joker origin stories. Like, I'm re he, you're right. He has an incredible rogues gallery. And uh, I kind of would love to see, um, I'd love to see off limits the Joker and Two Face. And then we got Riddler again, but I didn't really need Riddler this time. It could have been somebody new that we haven't seen. Let's let's see some new characters in some new ways and um and and broaden the the, the bench strength a little bit. Uh, I I really I think we're done with the Joker. I agree. Maybe not done forever, but done for now. Done for now. No, yeah. I haven't given my take on him yet. I think I should get in there on the big screen. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You nailed it. Is that pretty line. good? That's pretty good, right? It is me, that's the Joker. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. It did nice. Well, if you're going to do that, I want you to spend a little bit of time after your shooting to uh, warm up your Oscar speech because that right there, <laughs> that right away, right yeah. there, is, that's that's yep. they're just going to hand you a statue before the movie's <laughs> even shown. Like, why are we when principal yep. filming is done? Let us hand it to you from the trailer. Yep. They've never given a best performance by a male actor in a film trailer, <laughs> <laughs> but that's going to be it. Yeah. <laughs> We're on Letterboxd. A True Story FM's family of film podcasts are all part of the Next Reels HQ page. Letterboxd is a great way to track movies you see, write your own reviews, and be a part of a larger community of film lovers like yourself. Sign up for your own account today and if you upgrade to a pro or patron account use the discount code nextreel at checkout to save 20 percent this works for renewals as well pete what does this out of, yeah. out of the five stars with a heart what do you what letterbox rating do you give the batman why am I going first? Uh, 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 Why are you making me go first? God, this is a hard one. I I came out yesterday. I, I think I came out at a solid four stars for this movie with a heart. Um, I 
you know, I, I think sitting on it, I could nudge that up probably a half star. I think I could be, I, I feel like it's safe being a four and a half star movie. I liked almost everything about it. Interesting, Tom, that you feel like you need to go watch Seven. After talking about it with you guys, I feel like I need to go back and watch Joker. I am notoriously mm. uh, like uh, bearish on Joker. Oh. I, I felt like that was a movie that didn't need to be in the huh. universe. But after seeing this movie, I wonder if it if if it has a better fit. Interesting. Uh, so. so yeah, I, I think four and a half stars and a heart for the yeah, Batman. Are you, the are you then making a case that I should actually go watch Joker? Oh yeah, yeah. I th- I think you should go watch. I Joker. love Joker. I, yeah, I've. I also have a uh, strong feeling about the Joker in that, to me, the greatness of him and the reason he's number, a good reason why he is number one in Batman's Rose Gallery is because he doesn't have an origin story. He he, he is, yeah. he just is. He is chaos. He is doing what he does. That's it. Where did he come from? Who is he? Doesn't matter. Don't know. Don't care. So I I was very he- I am very hesitant to watch then a an origin story of a character that I feel deserves to not have one. Yeah, no, I, I that's you just described my perspective on it too. Like it, it is, it it's frustrating. It's a frustrating take because they they give it they give grounding to this character that should just have existed and never come into existence. It just is. It's chaos. It's what chaos is. Uh, but and that's why I didn't like it uh, attributing the Joker to it because Joaquin Phoenix does a great job as this character that should have been named something yeah. else. It's a well-made film. Well, thank you, Tom. Tom, you love I it. I do right? love it. Is that it? I'm giving this movie, <laughs> The Batman, four stars and a heart. And I think there there's a good chance it could move up to four and a half, but I would need to see it again. Well, you guys are... Uh, in my opinion, haters. Um, this <laughs> movie is five stars and a heart. Wow! And a it is amazing wow! from front to finish, from from front to back. Uh, to only give it four stars, yeah, you're just you're just you're oh hating on some great cinema here. Uh, this is I'm I'm reticent to say that <laughs> it, you can't get better because clearly you can. Because after I saw The Dark Knight, I've been like, well, Batman movies don't get better than that. Yeah, and like I said here. I'm not sure, but I'll know in seven days mm. whether or not this one truly is better than The Dark Knight <laughs> or not. Because I, I need to watch them closer together. Um, but it, you know, it, th- this movie is is great on so many levels. It gave me so much of Batman from a cinematic standpoint that I did not think I would ever see. And so for me, it's five stars and a heart. I will see this again in theaters. If I still bought DVDs and Blu-rays, I would buy it. But since I don't, I will stream it when it comes out later on. Perfect. We did it. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, this would be a great one. I hope when it comes out that one of the special features is a black and white version of it. Oh, interesting. I would love to see this. Sure. Yeah, that would be that would be interesting. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, Pete and Tommy, uh, for joining me to, to to talk about the the Batman. Um, so, um, I guess uh, as we close, uh, so uh, Pete, why don't you tell us what's coming up next for you in the next reel? Oh well, that's a great question. I should probably figure that out. I'll tell you what has gone live this week. As we were talking about it, big. We're still in our John Hurd series, and this is when John Hurd started playing the uh, general antagonist to the lovable doofus. And uh, we are continuing next week with Awakenings, where he is the antagonist to the lovable doofus, doofus, and then to Rambling Rose, where he is hardly even in the movie. <laughs> We really, really tied ourselves in knots getting this John Hurd series done. Uh, and so there you have it. But we love John Hurd, and we're excited to actually do some movies that he's in more later. So stay tuned for that. Uh, after that, we're getting into our coming-of-age debuts. That's coming in later March, and we're very excited about that. We got Salam Bombay. We got Slums of Beverly Hills. We've got Rat Catcher and the Virgin Suicides uh, in 13 oh, coming up. So it's, we, we've got love a... It. A heck of a, yeah, a heck of a series coming up for later nice. this month. Great. And uh, uh, Tommy, what's going on with you? Come, what's coming up with you in your True Story FM life? I'm probably, I'm thinking about Chipotle for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's it. <laughs> Stop that, Tom. You just directed a film, man. Oh, well, that's Can not a... Can you talk that's, about Okay, it? I just directed a, sh- a, a short film, and it's the first time I've made a horror film. Ooh! And the shoot oh. went really great, and I'm very excited about it, and I'm already forgetting how Premiere Pro works, so I have to figure all that out. But it was really, really <laughs> fun, and it's called Static right now, and we will let you know when it comes out, and you can see it. Goodbye cannot wait to see it especially it seems shocking to me that a guy like you had taken so long to make a horror i think i was afraid of it that's the same reason i don't sing prince at karaoke i like it too much yep no i get that anyway (laughs) don't forget to join our online community with fellow movie lovers learn more at the nextreel.com forward slash discord and again if you're not already a member please consider supporting this show to learn more visit the nextreel.com forward slash membership Please do the stuff you're supposed to do with your podcasts. Rate, review, subscribe, and of course, listen. But perhaps most importantly, share. Please let any of those movie lovers in your life know about the show. The best way we have to get more people listening is you. Thank you. The Film Board is a production of True Story FM. Engineering is done by Pete Wright. Find the show at True Story FM. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please do that for our show.